All of my life, even as a child, I would think to myself, why am I here? We are born into a world full of mysteries, and we must analyze this physical world to try to gain some knowledge into whether or not there is something more. Another mystery I ponder about is sleeping. Every night we go to bed, and a third of our lives we spend in a total distant place that is very difficult to understand. We call this phenomena dreaming. Our minds are always working and always thinking, consciously or subconsciously. When we sleep we often awake recalling stories that are usually extremely bizarre. Many times we forget our dreams after a short amount of time. Why does this happen? Although you will not be taught this in school, you and every other human on this planet has a third eye called the pineal gland. It is named after its pine cone shape. And reptiles, this gland has a retina, a cornea, and a lens. It is located at the geometric center of the brain, right between the two hemispheres of the brain and between the eyebrows. This gland is responsible for the creation of two chemicals, melatonin and dimethyltryptamine. Both chemicals have extremely similar structures to serotonin a chemical that exists mostly in the gastrointestinal tract but also in the neurons of the central nervous system. Serotonin is part responsible for the regulation of mood, appetite, sleep, muscle contraction, memory, and learning. Melatonin is a hormone that affects the modulation of sleeping patterns and seasonal functions. Dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, is an indigenous ethanogen, meaning it occurs naturally in our bodies. This chemical is produced in the pineal gland during heavy REM sleep and is created before death. DMT is a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 and is also the most potent hallucinogen. By this logic, everyone in the U.S. should be arrested for carrying. Also, it exists in many plants and in every ecosystem in the world. So everyone is actually going through this incredibly intense psychedelic trip when they sleep. It has correlations to many near-death experiences and actually UFO abductions. Structurally, it is comparable to serotonin, a neurotransmitter, 5-MeO-DMT, bufotenin, a hallucinogenic chemical found in certain frog species, and psilocin the product of psilocybin mushrooms being digested. In 1990, a scientist by the name of Rick Strassman began the first research in over 20 years on the effect of psychedelics. His original interest was finding a connection, perhaps in the brain, between mystical states such as meditation, near-death experiences, and psychedelic states. During the five years of the experiment, Rick administered 400 doses of DMT with 60 volunteers. This took place at the University of New Mexico's School of Medicine in Albuquerque. He has a great book on it called DMT the Spirit Molecule. During his research, Dr. Rick Strassman found that the pineal gland develops in the embryo at 49 days. The Tibetans believe that it takes the human soul 49 days to incarnate to the next life. At the same 49 day period, you can start to distinguish gender. With our body's last conscious experience, it lets out a large amount of DMT. Rick hypothesizes that the same thing may happen at birth and that the pineal gland could maybe exist as a literal portal into and out of our physical bodies. The doses of DMT are administered by smoking it. DMT can be synthesized as well as extracted from various plants. I have heard people say that explaining the effects of DMT is like explaining a kaleidoscope to a blind man. A DMT trip lasts about 5 to 10 minutes. DMT can be taken orally, but only with the assistance of an MAOI inhibitor, which prevents DMT from being metabolized. I found this excerpt by author Daniel Pinchbeck from his book Breaking Open the Head that articulates what a DMT trip is like very beautifully. 
And here's an excerpt from Daniel Pinchback's Breaking Open the Head on his first experience with DMT. As I had been warned, it was like smoking a shard of lawn furniture. With the next intake, the unfolding and unveiling began. Runes and geometric patterns filled the air, hovered around me, tattooed themselves over the walls, the furniture, the other people in the room. These images were copper or golden colored and I only had a few seconds to look at them. In those few seconds I saw an intricate interweave of sacred geometrical motifs, pentagrams, seals, and symbols, golden triangles, drawn from every mystical and traditional source. I seemed to be projecting forward at an incredible speed. At the periphery of my vision I saw twisting white columns like high-tech swizzle sticks, as if I was following a ladder or lattice up, or in or out of all of the above, to hyperspace. I had the sense of floating through a fractal tapestry, a curving and infolding plane of synthetic plastic, fantastic whiteness and gleaming colors in endless vibrant hues. This extra-dimensional realm I had pitched into was made, I felt certain, of data, of quantum equations, visible shamanic harmonics, and the self-weaving fabric of extra-dimensional superconsciousness. It was science fiction made fact, a dimension devoid of natural things, of plants and of human need, of our weak and imprecise symbol systems. DMT land was an interweave of tantric mandalas, virtual reality fantasies, stained glass areola, a ten-dimensional Walt Disney World projected into some far-fetched and far-flung future. There was in that place rushing toward me an overwhelming force of knowledge and sentience. I knew it was impossible that my mind on any level had created what I was seeing. This was no mental projection. This was not a structure within the brain that the drug had somehow tapped into. It was a non-human reality existing in a deeper level than the physical world. Suddenly I was rocketing through their cities. Multi-dimensional, jewel-fasted, hard and immaterial places where geometrical and tentacular constructions were being taken apart and reconstructed at lightning speed that I cannot recall more than a tiny trivial fraction of. They were humanoid as far as I can remember, which is unfortunately not far enough. I recall a blue entity, blue like the color of certain celestial Buddhas in Tibetan Tenka paintings. Gesturing in my memory, I see him with one hand raised, waving at me. There were fountains and spinning mandalas like lit up roulette wheels or flowering chakras that seemed organic as well as mechanical. At the center of the city, there was a great fountain like the fountain at the center of a Renaissance town square where bits of data or perhaps mathematical potentialities or burbling new test tube universes were flowing in rainbow patterns of ultraviolet froth. Descartes, the French philosopher slash mathematician slash physicist, believed in two characteristics making up man, a body and a soul. He also knew about the pineal gland. He actually called it the seed of the soul. Out of the many testimonies that I've heard about DMT, I have formed a general understanding of what happens in most cases. After the first few inhalations, the subject tends to fall back. The room starts to flood with geometric shapes. Joe Rogan, former host of the television show Fear Factor, described these as geometric shapes filled with love. Many experience pure white light vibrant golden colors. Soon after that they'll feel a feeling of transcendency. Some describe an audio hallucination at this point almost like crumbling plastic. The world they were once in has been replaced by a world of alien shapes and colors. What is really mind-blowing is a lot of the testimonies involve the subjects coming into contact with what is described as otherworldly entities of a greater power. For example, Joe Rogan talks about meeting a Buddha-like entity that told him not to give in to astonishment. Shortly after, very similar to dreaming, the subject would have trouble remembering what they just went through. After this experience, many feel it was life-changing they felt more humble and more aware. You realize we are all conscious human beings and everyone is equal. DMT has been administered on heroin addicts, 
whose addictions were cured after only one use. I know you're probably skeptical, and I can't blame you. The information is out there, and it's relatively reputable. I'll end this with one qu quote from Rick Strassman. I'm hopeful that these reports will accelerate interest in the non-material realms using whatever intellectual, intuitive, and technological tools we possess. Once there is enough interest in it, and even demand for information about them, such phenomena might become an acceptable topic for national inquiry.